Calvary Chapel presents Pastor's Perspective, a one-hour program that gives a biblical and pastoral viewpoint on the theological, social, and practical issues of the day. We'll be taking your calls in just a moment. But first, here's today's host. Well, hi, everybody, and welcome to the Thursday edition of Pastor's Perspective. Yes, it's terrific Thursday here, and I'm Don Stewart and with Pastor Brian Broderson, who I can see on camera right now, and you'll start hearing the excited people in the background. Can't wait to hear Brian answer the questions in the coffee shop at the Calvary Chapel Conference Center in Murrieta, California. Um, if you want to ask a question today about what we believe as Christians, why we're Christians, or how to live the Christian life, the toll-free number, one 888 Five six four six one seven three one eight 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 five six four sixty one seventy three. And if you want to watch the program live and in color, you can watch us on his channel, www.kwve.com or at calvarychapel.com. Brian, welcome to the program. Thank you, Don. Great to be with you. Good to see you. I see that people are excited that you're on the air today. They're all making noise and getting <laughs> yeah. thrilled. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're just excited as they were the other day. Nobody's <laughs> even nobody even notice knows I'm here. They're just going about their business, just having great conversations around the room. But yeah. that's okay. That's okay. Well, you, you know I'm here. I know you're you here. I can see, see you. I can see it. Yeah. So how was the uh, conference going since Tuesday? What's been happening since then? Yeah, it's been great. We've just had a lot of um, you know, really, really encouraging uh, things happening with, uh, you know, teaching, great, great teaching sessions. We had a really great session this morning with uh, Pastor Julian Duguid from uh, Cape Town, South Africa, mm. and just gave a tremendous message um, from, uh, you know, I don't know if you remember, Don, but in the news about a month ago, there's a South African missionary that was killed in Afghanistan. Him yes. and his two children Heard were about killed that. by the yes. Taliban. Yes. Yeah, so Julian used that as sort of a springboard into the message to talk about mm. uh, the resurrection. And, you know, that, that particular man had said on one occasion uh, fairly recently, he said, everybody's got to die. You might as well uh, die for Jesus. And mm. that's exactly what he ended up doing. So, wow. so anyway, Julian gave a really encouraging message. Uh, and then uh, I just walked out of uh, Pastor Chet Lowe. Chet's the outreach pastor from Calvary Chapel, right. Fort Lauderdale, and he's, he's just giving a dynamic message. He was a, he was a missionary church planter in Liberia for several years. Mm. And so, you know, he's just got all of these amazing stories about life in Africa, and it was really, really good stuff. Yeah, and lots of great fellowship, lots of great networking taking place. Uh, so, yeah, it's good. It's all good. Good. Now, again, how if people can still watch it. Or is, it's, you've got one more day, right, tonight? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tonight and then we go through um, we go through noon tomorrow. So it's live dot calvarychapel dot com. Live and you can Cal tune in. Okay. You can tune in to the various uh, teaching sessions, and then uh, they've got you know they're just interviewing all kinds of people from different places around the world, getting the backstory on you know some of the countries people are ministering in and so forth. So. Yeah, it's good. And I, I guess we've had a lot of viewers at calvarychapel.com. Wonderful. It's been a really, uh, yeah, it's been a really great event. That's so. fantastic. All right. Yeah, it's good. Um, on on the, the not-so-good side, we're just getting some news. Uh, so, some, of the, some of the folks here are ministering in the U.K. The U.K.'s immigration department has just suspended the, the visas of a number of Christian workers, 350 YWAM uh, workers are just, um, their visas were revoked wow. yesterday, and we just got news today that um, some of ours were revoked as well. So so something to keep in prayer, and uh, we'll see, you know, who knows what the, the you know, who, who knows what the, the ultimate motive is for this. You know, they, they uh, it's one of those crazy things where, in a sense, they're trying to crack down on Islamic yeah. um terrorism and Muslim immigration, but then because they've got to be politically correct, they just kind of kick everybody out, you oh know, boy. so they can't be accused of, you know, yeah. here, you know, we're, we got to kick the guys out that are trying to kill us, but we're going to kick out the guys that are doing good stuff too, because we don't want anybody to think we're unfair. Yeah, you know, one of the so, headlines today, Brian, is that Britain's MI5 warns there's an Al-Qaeda <laughs> planning a mass attack on the West. Why would they kick out the Christians then? I'm, I don't get it. Well, it's the it's the crazy political correctness, you know, that the, these so many of these politicians live with, and um, you know, Don, they just can't. You know, a lot of them don't want to make any kind of a distinction between yeah. uh, 
<laughs> Christianity and Islam. So oh boy. it's it's the craziest thing, but uh, it's just it is what it is. But you know, we're we're praying for these sure. folks and we're trusting God's got a bigger plan. So uh, but that's a little bit of the yeah. negative news that came yeah. our way. Okay, the knee jerk reaction. Well, uh, we haven't talked obviously since the massacre happened yesterday morning. Uh, how long much you've been following that, or what? And what are your thoughts? Yeah, I've been I've been keeping up on it, just reading up. Yeah, you know, it's um, you know, kind of reminds me of the situation in Holland. You know, back when yes. they they murdered the um, uh, you know the the producer, the filmmaker right. there because uh, they felt that he was anti-Islam and. Um, so yeah, it's, it's crazy stuff, yeah, you know, yeah. and, uh, just, just reading up that I guess these guys were trained by Al Qaeda. And, um, so one, one of them surrendered, right? Right. And, the youngest you know, they, one. The they're two, still on the, yeah, yeah, still on the hunt for two. Yeah, yeah. They think they're in a forest somewhere outside of Paris. That's pretty, pretty large. And so it's kind of a, uh, a, a total manhunt there, but it's, you know, obviously people were on edge. There was a female police woman killed in Paris today, also shot in the back. And so it's, uh, no you're, kidding. No, wow. yeah. So Europe and particularly Paris is on edge and there, and you're hearing stories from like Germany and, and England saying, you know, we're worried about something happening to us now too. So it's, uh, they're quite on edge there over in, over in the UK and in, and in, in the continent. So, mm-hmm. yep. Yep, crazy days. Crazy indeed. So what else we got going on? Anything else we need to talk about before we go to the phones? Uh, let's think. Anything else that we need to talk about before we go to the phones? Well, we are uh, just on the verge here of entering into our week of prayer, so I'm excited about that. We're going to launch that on a Sunday night at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa. We'll be t- uh, taking every night of the week uh, for, for the week. Uh, beginning Sunday evening and canceling all of the other services and doing um, just, you know, times of prayer. And we're going to pray. We're going to pray for everything. We're going to pray for every, everything we can, we can imagine to pray for each night. You know, we'll have a different set of things we're going to pray for. We'll have a different pastor leading it. And uh, we did this last year, Don, and it was just a tremendous uh, start for the year. And so we're looking forward to uh, week of prayer coming up here uh, beginning Sunday. It goes Sunday night through the following Saturday. And so, yeah, it's going to be good. Fabulous. Uh, then, Brian, for a second, talk about, because we mentioned it, the importance of prayer. Uh, we, we seem to underestimate it so often and why it is so important to be people of prayer. Well, you know, Don, this is our lifeline. You know, yep. this is where we connect with the Lord. This is where we bring our request before God. We uh, solicit His help and things that need to be done. And, you know, there's, yep. there's tons of things, obviously, we can't do. Nope. And, um, and even things that we can do, we need the help of God to do them. So prayer uh, does both. You know, it gives us the strength to do what we can do and then gives, uh, you know, it calls upon God to do things that we can't do. And, you know, I think as we look around the world today and, you know, what, what can a person who's listening to us right now, concerned about the affairs of the world, concerned about the Paris, uh, terrorist yep. attacks, the possibility of more attacks coming, you know, what can a person like that do? Well, um, you know, somebody, you know, might be in a position to do uh, something on a practical level, but what all of us can do is pray. And, uh, you know, we can pray that God will protect and we can pray that God will expose these plots and schemes and things and uh, overthrow these attempts at these murderous acts. And um, there's there's power in prayer. Yeah. And and Jesus prayed. He found it necessary to pray. So so should we. Right. Because uh, if he did, so should we. All right. Good enough. So prayer, people, we don't ever want to underestimate it. All right, speaking of prayer, we got a question about the Lord's Prayer. First, let's go to Catskills out in New York, and let's talk to Maria here on Terrific Thursday on Pastor's Perspective. Hi, Maria. Welcome to the program. Good evening, guys. Thank you for taking my call. You're so welcome. I need You're to welcome, Maria. a clarification on the Lord's Prayer. Right. I was told, I was corrected, I, I was Catholic, and the Lord's Prayer, I never got out of that mode of saying it without the dot of for thine is the kingdom and the power and glory now and forever. Amen. Right. Now, in my Bible, it has like, is it inserted? Which is the correct way? Is it with 
Yeah. Or without. Very good question, Maria. Okay, Brian. They, uh, mm-hmm. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Does it belong or not? Yeah. Well, you know, Don, there's some uh, debate about that, right? Yeah, there's some there manuscripts that contain it and some manuscripts that don't. And so some Bible versions have it and some uh, put it in as an insertion. Uh, others like the King James Version, you know, which just have it straight there. Mm-hmm. Um, is it in both Matthew and Luke, Don, or is it just in one? No, um, just Matthew. It, I, I, it's a, Luke leaves it off, right? Correct. Correct. But Luke, it's, it's yeah, the one Luke. in Matthew, though, that is where the question is, where, where some of the yeah, manuscripts right. don't have it. And that's uh, it's Matthew 6, 13. Yeah. And, and some. Now, the, the point is, though, Maria, just to, just to put it into context, um, there's only 1.1% of the manuscripts that don't have it in. Uh, two of the oldest ones, three of the oldest ones, but 97.6% man- of the manuscripts have it in. And so the question is, did those 97.6% manuscripts add something that wasn't there, or did somehow it get deleted uh, by the you know 1.1% of the manuscripts? Um, yeah, it's and most Bibles today, unfortunately, I, I don't have it in. New King James, King James does, but you won't see that, or you'll see it like Maria sees it in brackets there. I think you can make an excellent case it was original with Matthew. What the argument is, though, Brian, that what happened later, there was some scribe in the early years that uh, got so, you know, overtaken with that, just wrote that <laughs> in, yeah. and so that's how it got part of Matthew's text. <laughs> right. So. <laughs> Right. You know, I can't remember right offhand, Don, but there's um, there's an old—this is an actual quotation from the Old Testament. It's an addition brought in from—there's an Old Testament passage, whether it's a psalm or something. I can't remember which one, where you find it. But um, so hmm. my vote is that it is there. And, of course, if you've got the majority of manuscripts, yep. and, I, you know, we know the, the academic debate about this yep. issue, but uh, if you've got 97% of the manuscripts containing it— and uh, you find it in the Old Testament as well, and it fits uh, perfectly in with, I think it's, it's a, to me, it's just the most natural ending to the prayer that Jesus teaches us to pray, right? Yes, it I mean, is. Yeah. You know, he starts off with, uh, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And then at the end, it's just a reminder, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Um, I like it. I, yeah. I pray it. I, yeah, yeah. I say it. I believe and, it. <laughs> and it. And it, the phrase is biblical. It's First Chronicles twenty nine eleven to thirteen. Yes, it is in the Old Testament. Yeah, and, and that was based on right. that. And again, the the argument goes, it was probably composed for the liturgy of the early church, based on this First Chronicles twenty nine eleven to thirteen, and that's how it got in the text. And so, uh, you know, there's people argue about it, but uh, the phrase is biblical. Let's put it that way, from the Old Testament, if not from the New. Yeah. So, Maria, right. um, there's no problem praying it, saying it, you know, when you do it. And um, you ever been in a situation, Brian, one of the Professor Clyde Cook, who, who was the former uh, president of Biola University, told a story. They were in England, and at the end of the service, they were all singing the Lord's Prayer. And there was five Americans in the back row, and when they got to the, you know, that part... <laughs> All the Americans, the yeah. British stopped singing. All the Americans sang it together. You know, they figured, well, we start, we might as well. Continue. Everybody turned around and looked at them. But, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it, it, that, that was a great story. I never forgot. So, yeah, thine is the kingdom, yeah. the power, and the glory forever. It's certainly biblical, Maria. And, again, First Chronicles 29, 11 to 13 has it into. All right, uh, let's go now to Dave from Riverside, California, next, as we come west here on Terrific Thursday. Dave, welcome to Pastor's Perspective. Hi. Hi, thanks for having me. Yes, sir. Hi, um, I had a question about um, um, dating. I am, of course, a believer in Jesus Christ. I had a question about dating um, somebody from the Jewish faith. Um, is that considered an evening deal? I've had um, some talks with my parents. And, of course, you know, I'm Hispanic, so they kind of come from that Hispanic kind of uh, charismatic, really... Uh, yeah. conservative point of view and mm-hmm. and although they love you know the the, the, the culture and, and of course the you know everything in the scripture is that you know we, we do come from Judaic roots but they don't see it as something that I can do and my question is if they're the chosen people of God and we are chosen through Jesus Christ what is the difference um, can you guys just Give yeah, a yeah, fight. yeah. We'd we'd love to talk about it, David. Well, yeah. well here, here's okay. a here's a question, Dave. The the question is, uh, is she um, is she a believer in Jesus Christ? Get Dave that back. that's the question that I would is ask. Is she a you. believer in Jesus, Dave? She does not. She does not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we have talks about it, she listens to me. Yeah. Um, but she it just seems that she just doesn't 
want to understand it. You oh. know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Okay. Is, is she religious as a Jewish person? Is she, um, you know, there's lots of people that are just Jewish ethnically, and they're not necessarily religious. What about her? She, she you know, she, I, I, it seems to me that she's kind of the, I celebrate Hanukkah, and I have these other little things, but it doesn't seem that she's, as, as I see with Christians, are actually connected to God through prayer, through, you know, yeah. um, communion, through congregating, all that kind of stuff. I mean, I'm sure she goes to mm-hmm. temple. I think she says she goes to synagogue like every now and then. Right. Yeah. But it doesn't seem as though she's, yeah. she's not know, observant. In other words. Okay. All right. Brian. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, you know, th- this would come down to, really, Dave, to the situation is it, you're a believer. She's not a believer. You know, whatever her ethnicity is or whatever her religious affiliation is, bottom line is she's not a believer. And you don't want to get yourself, uh, you know, deeply entangled in a, in a romantic, uh, you know, love, possible marriage kind of a situation with a person who's not a believer. Uh, it's just a, an unwise move and um, fraught with all kinds of problems down the road. So these are the reasons. You know, the, the passage in uh, Corinthians, 2 Corinthians that we cite, you know, not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, it, the passage, the context itself isn't marriage. The context is really false teaching if you look at the, the context closely. But uh, certainly marriage could, there could be an application to marriage because you're coming into uh, this side of uh, a relationship with God, this is the deepest, most intimate, most personal relationship you're going to have with anybody on the earth. So you definitely want to, that relationship, that vital relationship, you want to have uh, the commonality of, of a relationship with Christ. And so um, I would advise against pursuing the relationship in, the, in a boyfriend-girlfriend sense um, uh, certainly you can be a friend, certainly you can seek to, you know, win her over to Christ, but you don't want to get romantically involved uh, in a situation like this. Yeah, and you don't want to get emotionally involved either, Dave, because uh, it has nothing to do, like Brian said, with ethnicity. It's believer versus unbeliever, and the Bible's very clear on that. You know, there's no uh, communion we have, uh, light and darkness. Those who are outside the kingdom of God don't understand what we're doing. They don't understand the things of Christ. They won't understand you where your heart is, what's important to you. You need to trust the Lord on this one. I know it's tough sometimes when you meet someone, you think this is the right person. Well, uh, until if she comes to Christ, she's not the right person because that's just not the right thing to do. So, no, it's not a wise decision to make any way, shape, or form. Yeah. All right. And, you know, Don, over all the years, um, you know, of counseling people, I've yet to meet a person who went into a situation like this who didn't have... Um, some real challenges and some real problems, you know. In some cases, the person eventually, you know, that they married uh, eventually did become a believer, but they had uh, a lot of difficulty uh, on the road toward that. And in some cases, the person never becomes a believer. Sometimes the relationship yep. ends in a divorce. So it's just, it's just not the way to go. You know, Brian, I had a professor in Bible college that was talking about this, and he said he's never seen one case, like you just said, where it's worked out well. He said he thought he saw an exception. Uh, the woman, you know, uh, the, the, the people, I, I guess it was the husband came to Christ later. But um, when they had a child, the child started dating an unbeliever, and they confronted the child and said, well, you know, why are you dating an unbeliever? So, well, look, mommy married daddy, you know, uh, when he was an unbeliever, so I'm <laughs> yeah. going to marry Mark. And, he, and then the person said this, I would rather be in hell with him than in heaven with Jesus, and because of the example that was set yeah. for them. So it's not a win-win in any way, shape, or form. All right, so, yeah. okay. Uh, let's uh, back to the phones we go to the Windy City from Chicago, Illinois, where it's very cold right now, and Rob is with us now on Terrific Thursday. Rob, welcome to the program. Hi. Thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate you taking my call. Yes, sir. I am, uh, I am currently in the process of being reborn. Uh, thanks a lot in part to a friend I recently made acquaintance with from Southern California who happened to be the person who turned me on to your show. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, my great. question pertains, uh, relates to the subconscious. And my question is, when you're sleeping at night and you have a dream and you sin in your dream, how is that looked at? Is that a sin or is that not a sin? That's, that's a great question, Rob. Okay, Brian, um, 
very practical question. It is a great question. Yeah. And Rob, I am very thankful that it's not a sin. Yeah, not <laughs> because, at all. <laughs> uh, I've, had, I've had lots of dreams where I've been sinning in the dream. Yeah. And then when I wake up, I think, oh, thank you, Jesus, that that was a dream. <laughs> or in some cases, a nightmare, really. Yeah, really. Uh, and it wasn't a reality. So, you know, look, we, we don't have any control over uh, what goes on in our minds. You know, there are people that... Uh, even suffer sometimes from a, sort of a satanic kind of attack in mm-hmm. their dreams, and uh, this, it's a you know you're 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 asleep, you're in in somewhat of a vulnerable place. So the enemy will sometimes attack us, and sometimes through uh, dreams that are, are sinful. But I no, it's you know no. sinning is uh, you're you're it's an act of your will. You're you're looking at something that's wrong, and you know it's wrong, but you're going ahead and doing it that that would be sin and of course when you're sleeping that's not the case so you you know brian part of the problem is all the the stuff we take in during the day if you're watching the news you see all this horrific stuff and your mind can put certain things together in the subconscious and you certainly can't help Mm -hmm. that and so it no rob it's not not a sin whatsoever um the best thing you can do uh is try is Try to pray as much as you can while you're falling asleep. At least you're thinking on better things and good things. That that may help, but it, again, it's it's not yeah. a, not a cure all any way, shape, or form because there are things that happen during the day we see that are on our mind or subconscious brings to us while we're sleeping, and it's certainly not something we can control whatsoever. All right, great question. Glad you're listening to the program. Look forward to hearing you in the future. And I'm told it's 12 degrees there in Chicago, so I guess it warmed up a bit from where it was the other day. All right, um, Allison from San Clemente has got an interesting question here. Allison, welcome to Pastor's Perspective on Terrific Thursday. Hi. Hi there. And I hate to say to Rob, it's about 80 out here, and I'm standing on the beach. With <laughs> yeah, quite a contrast, um, isn't it? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I have a question. On Monday, there was a caller who had a question about a book. And I don't remember exactly the name of the book or any of that, but she mm. had a question about stars. Right. And when I heard the answer, it confused me a little because there's a book on k Wave's website that I bought that I loved, and it just talks about the Zodiac and the, um, the, the Jewish faith and bringing the Christian brothers together with the Jewish faith, um, and it just, oh, and then the seven feet. And it really confused me, because in a book, I take it as a Christian book, they mention that these Zodiacs are telling Christ's story before God had the written word, that mm-hmm. Seth's the one who kind of read the stars for people. Yeah. And I wanted your perspective on that. Okay, yes, you will hear it. Okay, Brian, you want to go first on that? Yeah, well, this uh, this is called the, the the zodiac or the Hebrew word the Maseroth, and uh, there there is a theory that the gospel is um, written in the the Maseroth or or the zodiac that the different figures you know that you that you can sort of make out when you're looking up at the heavens that that in each of these figures as you go through there's a story of the gospel. Now, this really is pure speculation. I mean, there's absolutely no, there's nothing in the Bible that says that the gospel is uh, written in the stars. There's nothing in the Bible that says the Maseroth is the story of Christ coming. So, so this is just, uh, it's somebody got the idea that maybe this was the case and they wrote a book about it and a few people have written books on it. Um, but the Zodiac, you know, as, as we know it today, as people use it today, um, it's more along the lines of something occultic rather than you know, biblical or, or, you know, spiritual in the sense of something that God would approve. So um, that's what we were referring to. Yeah. What it, do you think, Don? Yeah, it's from a 19th century work um, by a woman named Rawlinston, and it was picked up by two scholars from the 19th century that, that usually are pretty good, Joseph Seiss and another man, um, uh, uh, what's his name? I, I just uh, escaped my name, Joseph Seiss, Book of Revelation. And then the guy with the, um, what was his name? I'll get it in a second. Anyway, bottom line. Was it, was it Cla- Clarence Larkin? No, 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 not Clarence Larkin. Who was the guy? Oh, come on. It's at the tip of my the Oh, uh, yeah. Um, Chuck Missler. Bullinger, E.W. Bullinger. <laughs> yeah, that's, well, he, yeah. <laughs> Bullinger, I'm thinking, okay. Slice and Bullinger in the 19th century. They took Rawlinson's work on the, cons- Francis Rawlinson, on the constellations. And basically the bottom line is this. God named all the stars, told Adam the name, the names were passed on, and before the written revelation, the gospel was in the stars. Doesn't work any way, shape, or form. It's not good (laughs) scholarship, because a number of the Hebrew names of the stars, we don't know the meaning of them, okay? And just like Greek, every Hebrew word 
has a number of different meanings depending on the context. In fact, uh, one of the Hebrew words, the word for soul in that, is used uh, you know, in, in 46 different ways in English translation depending on the context in the Old Testament. And so it just doesn't work. Uh, Allison, there's nothing scripturally that says it. That's the bottom line that, that even would allude to that. Uh, this woman, Frances Rolleston, in the 19th century, uh, was somewhat of a linguist, got the idea from it, uh, started playing around with it. Uh, two scholars, again, Bullinger and Seitz, picked it up, and it's been popularized uh, recently, well, and, and it's over the years been popularized, but scholars don't give it any, any um, you know, credence in any way, shape, or form. Now, I'm interested, so did you know we had a book on that was promoted here, Brian, well, on the you radio? Know, I, you know, I'm, I'm uh, going to I'm going to find out about that. Yeah, I was gonna, I was, that was my next question. <laughs> look you. into that, yeah. yeah we, well, we, Don, yeah. wasn't, wasn't it, um, I think it was Missler in one of his books. He, yeah. you know, he was big into the Maseroth. I heard him right. talk about it a bunch of times. Right. So uh, perhaps there's something connected with Chuck Missler there. Yeah. Now, in, like we mentioned on Monday when the question came in, Allison, there's a, an astronomer named Danny Faulkner who wrote a, a great article on this in the Answers in Genesis website, AnswersInGenesis.org. It's about a 90-page article he wrote, went into great detail, showing the fallacy of this whole thing. And he's an astronomer, he's on staff at AIG, and he did an excellent job of going through the history of it, uh, talking about what Rawlinson said, how it was picked up and popularized, and where the problems are and how it doesn't make sense. Because there's about eight assumptions there in this doctrine that all have to be true, and none of them are biblical, none whatsoever. You have to read that into the text, and there's just nothing there would give the slightest hint of that in Holy Scripture. So hopefully that helps out somewhat. Uh, we don't need the Zodiac pointing people to Christ. We've got the, got the New Testament, <laughs> and that's sufficient yeah. enough. <laughs> All right. Thank you for the question, and enjoy the 80-degree weather there. Did you hear that, Rob, in Chicago on the beach there in San Clemente? We don't like rubbing it in because our friends back yeah. east are in a, and in the Midwest in a tremendous cold spell, too, and it's going further well, you east. you know, it, it, got, it got real cold, you know, with us, Don. It got down to the 40s, so we were, we were shivering. We yeah. were freezing <laughs> i see a smile we were ready there. to yeah. <laughs> yeah well you know it was in the we were getting on our yeah. down parkas and everything yeah. but that's because we're not used to it you know it was in the 20s in louisiana today in new orleans and baton rouge and that some of the lowest temperatures they had so the the frigid weather is hitting a, gr a great part of the u.s but not not quite not obviously san Clemente where allison's on the beach at, at 80 degrees <laughs> All right, thanks for the weather report there, Alice. <laughs> we'll, we'll go on with, uh, okay, let's go to Gary from Long Beach, California. Gary, welcome to Pastor's Perspective on Terrific Thursday. Hi. Hello. Uh, <laughs> I had a question about uh, baptism in the Holy Spirit. That's in the book right. Of Acts. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, my question is, people uh, uh, at Chief and Minister have a special relationship to uh, uh, are baptized in the Spirit uh, in the book of Acts or that people who are just uh, saved and just believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior and just been saved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, what about that, the speaking in tongues, baptism of the Holy Spirit? Are there any signs, outward signs of that, such as speaking in tongues, Brian, that some denominations say? Well, there are some uh, extreme Pentecostal denominations, Don, that insist that uh, unless you speak in tongues, you're not really... Yeah. A Christian, but they would be a very small number uh, of people that hold to a view like that. That's an extreme view, and it's obviously a completely incorrect view. You can easily disprove it from the scriptures. Uh, Paul, uh, even among um, you know uh, some other other uh, Pentecostals, would question whether not whether you're saved, but they would question whether you're baptized in the Holy Spirit if you yep. haven't spoken in tongues. But Paul in First Corinthians twelve. He, uh, I think, makes it clear that not everybody speaks in tongues. He asks a series of rhetorical questions there. Um, are all apostles? Uh, the answer is obviously no to every question. And he asks the question, do all speak in tongues? The answer is no. So, uh, no, uh, you do not have to speak in tongues uh, in order to prove that you are a Christian. No, not whatsoever. And so, it, 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 you know, some people do, some don't. We believe, we strongly believe the gift is still there. But it is not for everybody, but it's certainly not a sign of the reception of the Holy Spirit. And actually, it wasn't in the book of Acts. When you read the book of Acts, in a number of cases, people received the Spirit of God, and uh, there was no outward sign. No, you know, we're not told on the, on the day of Pentecost when 3,000 people believed. We're not told that any of them spoke in tongues. Now, the disciples did previous to that, but nothing was said about the people who did believe. Well, they're in the background fighting against the noise with Brian as the music, <laughs> saying we're halfway through. <laughs> and, right. and Brian, of course, is in the studio there. Well, in the coffee shop. I'm in the studio here. Coffee shop. Coffee yeah. shop, drinking coffee and having a good time. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. So stay right with us. 
And we're back with you with the second half of Pastor's Perspective here on this terrific Thursday. I'm Don Stewart. We're broadcasting here from our studio in uh, Southern California at uh, Costa Mesa, California at Calvary Chapel. And Brian is in Murrieta at our conference center at the Missions Conference this week. And you can hear from the background the people are very excited he's on the air right now because they've all gathered in the coffee shop to listen to him and drink coffee. <laughs> Maybe not necessarily in that order, but that's what they're there for. So, Brian... Uh, you know <laughs> you know what I do get, though, Don? I get an occasional smile, people walking by, and, a, and occasionally somebody will stop and take a picture. Oh, good. Well, they, that's <laughs> something. They probably wonder what you're doing there, right? You, they probably do. You yeah. need a big, they have no idea what we're doing. They need a big sign They have saying, no idea that I'm looking at you on a screen right now having yeah, a conversation. Yeah, me either. You. And the, you need a sign saying live broadcast going on, pretend to pay attention to something like that. Like, we've yeah. had some interesting things, like I said, over the years, they start doing that grinding machine in the background where we're trying to give an answer, and people yelling yeah. at their friend. Now, well, that's all right. But it, it's, it's part of the ambiance, and they're, I'm yeah, glad they're having know, a good time. Yeah, and I, you know, I kind of like it. I don't know. It's, yeah, it's different. Um, all of that sort of white noise in the background. Yeah, it's good. You know, yeah, just, it's it's kind of comforting. Yeah, it's good. So anyway, <laughs> that's that's the noise you're hearing, people. It's not because we can't get it out. It's because Brian is there in the coffee shop. And it's exciting. People will go there and, and talk and, and stay there for hours and hours to the wee hours of the morning sometimes talking about the things of God. So it's a great meeting point there. And particularly, like you're saying, Brian, and this is a point we want to reemphasize, when you have a conference like this, what a great opportunity for pastors and missionaries to network, right? To really help each yeah. other in their ministries. Yeah, yeah, it really is that. It's it's really a time. Uh, I've heard this over and over again. As a matter of fact, yesterday we had a we had a meeting, um, and you know we, what we do is we'll have these sort of breakout meetings where we'll say, okay, everybody who's interested in or involved in ministry in Africa, you know, the African continent, right. why don't you meet in this room? So. You know, all these people will come together and find out that they're, uh, wow, we didn't, we didn't know that you were, uh, sometimes they're in the same country, sometimes they're doing a similar kind of a work, but they didn't even know the other group existed. So it's a good way to kind of find out who's doing what and yeah. where, and then, and then, you know, build relationships, connect. Hey, well, since we're so close, we're going to go back home and we're going to plan something together. So yeah, there's lots of great things going on here. Wonderful. All right, well, let's go back to the phone, start talking to people out there in Radio Land. Let's go to Linda from Los Angeles, California, next on Terrific Thursday here. Linda, hi there. Welcome to the program. Hi, thank you, Pastor. Uh, You're welcome. Yes, hi. I had a question about honoring your father, um, who Mm -hmm. isn't really living a godly life. Um, My biggest concern for me is that he's also an elder at a church. Mm. And so all my life we lived you know, we grew up in this Christian family, and as he's getting older, he's just kind of going away from him, um, God, and just found out he had an affair with the woman at his church. Mm. So now I'm so torn on how to, you know, obey God's word and obey and dis- I mean, honor my father when I-, I just don't know how I could possibly do that. And I have my own family, and I have a yeah. seven-year-old who misses her grandfather who we just don't see anymore because of this incident. I don't know how to explain to her either. Yeah, yeah. Linda, so what is your perspective? Yeah, great question. The fact, Linda, you're an adult, you're out of the house, you have your own family. It's a whole different ball game, isn't it, Brian, than one still living in the house? Absolutely, yes. Uh, you're a grown woman with your own family, and I think you just, you know, you just make the decision if you if you don't feel that it's a good thing for your you know kids to be in that environment now then that's your decision uh you know you can uh, you can honor a person um without condoning their behavior and i think you know in in regard to honoring them it just means you're respectful you're courteous you're gracious you know you're you're just those things uh, that's not that's not a, an agreement with their lifestyle or behavior. It's just simple, uh, you know. It's it's just the way we ought to be as Christians. So I, I think you can do that. You, you don't have to, you know. Like we said, you're you're a grown woman. You're on your own. You're you're not subjected to uh, having to be obedient to your father or anything like no. that. So I would say just just be gracious and respectful and and loving and uh, forgiving and just show. Just show the love of Jesus to him, and you know God's God, God's got to do something in his heart, right? He's been, yeah. like you said, he's been in church for years, but he's obviously been living a hypocritical life. Um, who knows? Maybe just uh, the love of God coming through you and others will be the thing that breaks through for him. Yeah, and uh, 
Brian, it, it, again, case by case basis, sometimes you need to just tell them if they ask, well, how come you know I'm not invited over more often? You can just say, say bluntly is because the life you're living is not consistent with what you're, you're, you're preaching and what you're telling the world. Yeah. And if you've already done that, Linda, then you just pray for them, like Brian said, and try and be a witness there. And hopefully uh, the longing for Christian fellowship, the longing for the family will do something there. So anyway, um, mm-hmm. yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. But the key yep. is you're not you're a grown woman. You've got to do your own life. And you've got to raise your child correctly, too, with good examples there. And the last thing you need is an example that's saying one thing and living something else. All right, uh, Pasco, Washington we go to now. And Kelly is with us here on uh, Terrific Thursday. Hi, Kelly. Welcome to the program. Hi, thank you. Yes, sir. I, I just had a... First, I want to thank you guys uh, for doing this every day. I listen to you guys pretty much every day. Oh, wonderful. Uh, coming home from work and all. My question is, Is when was the last book of the Bible written? Okay, you mean chronologically? Is that what you're talking about? Well, yeah, it, it, Okay, Jesus Christ was the, pretty much the end of the Bible and whatnot. Um, so was there anything written after him? or? Yeah, okay. I got, we got it. All right. Okay. Bri- the, got it there, Kelly. Okay, Brian, the chronology, the last book penned that became part of the New Testament. Yes, obviously after the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, because you've got the writings of Paul, the Gospels, every book was written after the life and ministry of Jesus. The last one chronologically. Right. The book of Revelation would be the last book uh, chronologically written. Nobody knows the exact date that it was written. People assume that it was written, uh, you know, between 70 A.D. and 90 A.D., sometime there. And, uh, of course, the book of Revelation is really the end of the Revelation as well. When you look at it, it's it's the consummation of of everything. Um, It's the ultimate, you know, unfolding of, of who Jesus is. And it leads us out into the future. It takes us out into an actual new heaven and a new earth. So Genesis is the first book chronologically. And um, as you go through the Old Testament, not the Old Testament isn't necessarily in chronological order. It is to some degree, but not strictly, because there are books that aren't really historical narrative. There are books that are poetic and uh, things like that. And, of course, the, the, the prophecies, um, if you read, you know, you've got uh, Isaiah... Uh, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and then you've got the the minor prophets. But um, the assumption would be, you, okay, Isaiah was the first guy, then Jeremiah came, then Ezekiel. That that is true there. But then when you go into the minor prophets, some of the minor prophets yep. were contemporaries with Isaiah or contemporaries with Jeremiah. So, uh, but generally you have a uh, you know a, a fairly uh, consistent chronology. But the book, all of that to say, the Book of Revelation is the end of the Bible. Yeah, and what's interesting about this too, Kelly, is that what we find is, you know, the Apostle Paul obviously wrote all his letters, the 13, 14 letters of the New Testament before he died in year A.D. 67, and Jesus died in A.D. 33, so that's 44 years uh, from the time of the death and resurrection of Christ that his books were written. Uh, You can make an argument that actually all four Gospels were written before A.D. 70 also, when the city of Jerusalem was destroyed. So within a one-generation or a 40-year period, or less than 40 years, the four Gospels were written, the letters of Paul were written. In fact, the great part of the New Testament was written, with the exception, as Brian mentioned, the book of Revelation, probably in the early 90s, mid-90s, when he was banished to the Isle of Patmos. But it seems uh, every other one, you can make an excellent case, written within the generation of uh, the first disciples. And this is important, Brian, because the eyewitnesses are still around, both friendly and unfriendly. And if you're telling a story, they could be a most powerful corrective, couldn't they, if you tend to depart from the facts. And the fact is they, yep. uh, were, they were called a lot of things. They never called liars. And so that's, that's yeah. what's amazing about this. Right. And, and, you know, for years, Don, people, uh, scholars, uh, skeptics, uh, tried to insist that the New Testament wasn't written until, yep. until you know, hundreds of years after the fact. But now all of the evidence uh, shows, uh, all, the, all, the, all of the archaeological evidence and so forth uh, is against those theories. Yeah. What, what's interesting um, is that the things that we find in the New Testament, the, the mention of people, places, events, customs, and that, 
They fit exactly what we know that were the customs at the time Jesus was living. In other words, you don't have something that's kind of anachronistic that happened 100 years before. No, these customs were going on, these laws at the very same time. The New Testament says Jesus existed. The people were the right people were mentioned, the right leaders were mentioned, the right geographies there. And so everything tells us that it was written by eyewitnesses or or people who recorded eyewitness testimony. In other words, trustworthy. All right. Exactly. Great question, Kelly. Appreciate that, and thank you for your kind words. All right, let's go to uh, Mike from Pomona, California, here on our Thursday edition of Pastor's Perspective. Hi, Mike. Welcome to the program. Hey, uh, Donnie, Sue, and Pastor Brian Broderson. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you, sir. Thanks, hey, Mike. Hey, uh, thanks for taking my question. I yes. got a two-part question. Sure. Um, I was reading Genesis again, and I went through the plague, and uh, I never caught this the first time I read it, but uh, I noticed that one of the plagues, like after the frogs, wiped out all the livestock and uh, killed all of them because they used the word all. Mm-hmm. And then later on, a couple plagues later, the boils went after the livestock, and then the firstborn also went after the livestock. Right. So my, my two-part question is, did they happen like real fast, okay, or were they like a year apart? Um, and before you answer that, real quick, did you guys get any boxes of almonds uh, <laughs> over the holidays? No, did you leave some for us? I did. I left 10 cases uh, for, for you two guys. Really? Yes. Somebody got them, uh, at least for me. <laughs> were they okay. just put, almonds, like almonds? regular almonds, or were they Reg- chocolate covered? They're almonds with chocolate, oh. and then they're almond snacks, and they came in 10 boxes, 10 cases. Of we got them. You got them? We got them. Oh, good, good, em. good. All right. Good, well, good. hey, that goes for our little almond factory. Oh, in, uh, well, good. Well, well, bless your heart. Thank California. you so much. Thank you so, so much. Yeah. We appreciate that. Yeah. They were you, fantastic. We yeah. we enjoyed them. Don didn't get any. No, I didn't get I, any, I but them. Brian did. And, you know, <laughs> anything chocolate that comes in this office, Brian, is gone about the moment it hits the ground. So, it's it's it, you know, if you don't if you're not there when it takes place, you're not going to yeah. get it. The whole office staff enjoyed those all. Okay, glad to hear that, Mike. Thank you so much for your <laughs> kindness. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, the plague. The old. This is a regular question we get. Okay. The, the the animals in the field, Brian. What was going on? Yeah. Well, you know, this this is taking place over different parts of Egypt. So there, when it says all, it's speaking about all of the animals in this particular uh, location where this is going on. So you have, you know, some of the animals, in that case, it's saying all, but then it, and then suddenly they appear again. Uh, well, it's just the location is, is a, a slightly different location from the previous one. That's the way I would understand it, rather than the plagues. The plagues didn't happen over years and yep, years. No. They happened probably over weeks and months at the most. So it would just be... Um, you know, Egypt was a fairly large geographical area. I mean, it's not massive or anything, but, uh, you know, there were different parts. The land of Goshen, where the, where the Israelis were, was completely protected from yes. all of the stuff that was going on. So it was different parts of the country that were being decimated during the different plagues. Yeah, it's not too much of a stretch to argue, too. That was going to be my answer. The land of Goshen, where the Israelites are, their livestock was saved, so the Egyptians probably procured probably some of them uh, for themselves once theirs were all destroyed, or at least many of them were. So that's not above yeah. them of doing something like that. And of, the good news is, of course, at the end of the day, the Israelites were to borrow from their neighbor. In other words, take what the back wages were and, and possibly also for, you know, even taking some of their animals from them. And so that's why when they left Egypt, they didn't leave empty handed. They left a lot of gold, silver, that which, of course, they built the tabernacle with and had some great wealth going out, as was prophesied. So, you know, they were pretty much rapid fire, but the, the animal thing, it can be explained a number of ways. And the fact that uh, the Israelites were protected there in Goshen uh, means there were animals there. So most likely the Egyptians borrowed some of them themselves before further judgment came on them. Okay, great question, Mike. And thanks for the almonds. And uh, please feel free any time to deliver them. Uh, K-Wave's on the fifth floor here. Don't forget that (laughs) in the building. If you bring them in the main office. I got to tell you, Don, the one, the... um there, there were these chocolate-covered almonds with, with caramel, oh, and boy. they were fantastic. Oh. And I actually um, ate quite a few of those. You did. <laughs> so, so. Yeah, sorry you didn't get any. No, that's I think right. I have one bag left. Oh, that's okay. I, I have a bag left. I'll bring it, I'll bring it to you oh, next Oh, that's Tuesday. good. No, that's good. And, and Mike may be feeling led by the Spirit to bring more by here, K-Wave. <laughs> okay, but thank you, Mike. <laughs> that's very kind of you in that, too. And he's doing the chocolate-covered almonds. Those are, I don't know how good they are for us, but they, they sure taste good. All right. Uh, they do. Okay. Thanks, Mike. We appreciate that. Great, great, great uh, question there, and thank you so much. 
Um, let's go to Eli from Victorville, California. Because Eli's been waiting a long time. Thank you for your patience. You're on Pastor's Perspective. Hi. Hi, Pastor. Thank you for taking my call. Yes, sir. Uh, first, I actually wanted to say thank you. I don't know if you guys remember about uh, three months back, I had called and uh, asked for prayer because I had just started a high school ministry. Yes, yes, I remember that. There. And uh, everything's been a blessing. I'm actually going to be able to attend um, the conference next week. So, Brian, I might be able to see you. Wonderful. Wow. Great. Good, good yeah, for I'll, you, Eli. I'll be here on Monday. So, I'd love Great. to see you. Awesome. Yeah, it's been a blessing. So, thank you, guys. Um, my question is, uh, I was actually talking to a brother from church, and I kind of went through the same situation, but his is a little different. Um, he's recently, uh, he's newlywed and a, uh, starting his new family, but he, uh, he was taking care of his, uh, his mother, and he still is. But I know that he's torn in between because he wants to focus on his uh, new family, but also feels slightly obligated to take care of his, his mother because nobody else has actually picked up uh, and, and went with it. Now, he was just uh, um, asking for some, like, biblical advice. And I, I, honestly, I, all I had was the experience that I had with my family and helping them, but it was slightly different because they got back on their feet. Yeah. Uh, his, his mom yeah. is a little older, so uh, it's a little different. And um, I, I didn't really know... How to, how, what to say to him, so I was just asking what you guys' would, uh, what you guys advice was. Sure. Well, one thing we do know, Brian, every situation is different. There's lots of complications and things that enter in, but what, what would you say there to uh, Eli? Yeah. Well, I was going to say that very thing, first of all, <laughs> yes. Every situation yeah. is different, and yet, um, you know, just to the way you're describing it, Eli, w- with your friend, mm. Uh, you know, this is something that, as Christians, we're told that we are to show this kind of um, love at home, in the, in the home context. You know, uh, Paul talking to Timothy, he's talking about widows, and um, he's instructing Timothy on taking care of the widows in the church, but he refers to the ones who are widows indeed in the sense that they have absolutely nobody that can take care of them. He says, if they have family members, then the family members ought to be the ones bearing the responsibility rather than the church. Indeed. So uh, in this kind of a case, yeah, it's, it's an inconvenience. It's not the ideal situation. It's not exactly what we were hoping for. But, you know, this is kind of just the way life is. Life is full of inconveniences. And, but these are the things that uh, God, these are the things where our, our Christianity really works. You know, it, it really... Um, this is where you put into practice those things that you believe where you are inconvenienced uh, yeah. uh, because of a certain situation, but you show love and goodness and you know kindness and all those things by by doing the right thing by the person so uh, again we, we don 't know the details of his particular situation, but this is something you really pray about and seek the Lord on and I, I know lots of uh, Christian um, families who are in similar kinds of things yeah. and you know there, there there can be a real blessing there there are challenges of course but there can be a real blessing in uh, the midst of it as well yeah t- two things Eli number one the spouse obviously knew the situation before saying yes to marriage and that's part of the, the situation when you marry someone you know that's that came with it because they were taking care of an aging uh, uh, parent as that was the right thing to do and let me tell you something it may seem inconvenient now for some of the, you know, to have the elderly relatives around, but I tell you, once they're gone, you would really wish for that inconvenience. You would want to have them there again, because once they're gone, they're gone, and you want to take advantage of the time that you have with them, cherish the time, make the most of the time, and understand this, like Brian said, this is part of life, and, uh, and you know, so it's very important. If that was the situation before, particularly for the aging relative, you just don't throw them out because someone gets married. If someone's going to take the responsibility of marriage and they're looking after, you know, a relative who cannot look after themselves, certainly you just don't throw them out to the street. You continue on doing that. Yeah, it's difficult. No, it's not easy, but it's it's the right thing to do and it should be done. All right. Uh, God bless you on that, Eli. And, and yeah, go introduce yourself to Brian on Monday. On that, That's great. I remember the prayer. He wanted to get the ministry, Brian. We prayed for him a few months yeah. ago. And isn't it great to hear that he's, he's gotten into it now? So uh, yeah, we love hearing great. those answered you know, prayers. You know, Don, going back to that, not the specific situation, sure. but, you know, just in general, um, you know, you, th- you think of, of Christians, you think of pastors today, one of the uh, in one of the messages, that they were telling the story of, of Richard Wombrunt. Yes. You remember his oh, story, yes, you know, indeed. how he was... Um, he was imprisoned by the uh, the KGB, 
and uh, spent 14 years in prison mm-hmm. as a Christian minister of the gospel, and he was tortured, and he was put down in a 30-foot pit and in mm-hmm. solitary confinement for, for two or three years. And, you know, this, none of this stuff is convenient. No. <laughs> none of this stuff is, is what you think life ought to be. But th- this is just, you know, what this is what life in a fallen, sinful world is sometimes. But but this is this yeah. is what the gospel the gospel enables us to rise above these things and to do the right thing right. in in relation to these kinds of things. Yeah, and so um, that you know that's how we go the extra mile, and God honors that. And he blesses us for it for doing something like that. And because the parents are aging, you know, it's not going to be forever. Um, but if you make the decision to get married, you marry, you know, you marry the person, and if the person cannot, you know, you're supposed to leave father and mother, but the father and mother cannot, you know, exist without the other spouse, you've, you've got to be there with them, got to help them through it as best you can. All right, Frank from Rancho Cucamonga, California, has got an excellent question. Frank, thank you for, they're all the questions are excellent, by the way, on the board, but Frank, you're up next. Welcome to Pastor's Perspective. Hi. Hi. Um, hi, wow. Uh, first time getting through. <laughs> well, you're, um, Bless you. Thank you guys. Also, you know, first of all, thank you guys for having Pastor's Perspective. Um, I know there's not a lot of time. Uh, my my question was, I was um, understanding that in the Bible, it tells us that God gives uh, those who are in power and leaders, presidents and such, that He places them in power. Right. And in the Bible, it also tells us that King Saul and David, they were anointed by God and that we are not to harm or touch the anointed by God. Now, if a leader is ungodly, um, and I know this might be a hot topic in our country right now, or in many countries, but if a, if a yeah. president or a leader like, you know, an ungodly leader were to be assassinated, is that still going against God's anointing since he placed them in power? Is, is there a difference between that? Yeah, it's it's an excellent question, Frank, and it's one that's often asked. Uh, Brian, help him out. Well, I think we need to distinguish between, um, you know, anointing. Uh, yeah. the, these guys are not anointed. Uh, the, the, the word Christ is the anointed one. So the, the idea when you talk about an anointing is the Spirit of God is coming upon. So David is anointed. Saul was actually anointed as well. And that was a symbolic act. Oil was poured upon them, and the Spirit of God um, came upon them. So that's not the case with the people in our Congress or Senate or presidency or whatever. It's a different situation. So, uh, but the powers that be, Paul tells us in Romans 13, are appointed by God. So we recognize that the powers that exist, the governmental authorities, they are put in uh, position in order uh, to keep law in order, that's the, the primary purpose. And so, um, you know, of course, if somebody were to assassinate somebody, I mean, that's a crime, that's murder. That's, uh, you know, Christians would never participate in something like that. Um, in a, a, a government like we have, you have governmental structures. If you have rogue and, and uh, you know, evil rulers, you, you have the ability to, to deal with that. We have a, a government that has uh, checks and balances. We have three different aspects to our government. And they're, you know, uh, ideally, they're supposed to hold each other accountable. And so, um, you know, we have an impeachment process. We, ha- we have these different things that we can do. So, um, but, you know, at the end, you, you recognize that governmental uh, authorities in a, in a general sense, are appointed by God, and um, the individual persons involved are uh, people that we, we need to pray for yeah. and submit to, uh, with the one exception of violating God's Word. So as long as there's no uh, mandatory direction coming down from the government that we are to discontinue reading our Bibles, or we can no longer talk to people about Jesus, or we can't worship Him, then we, generally speaking, follow what the government tells us to do. That's what a Christian is to do. Indeed. And pray for the leaders. Pray for the people that are in those positions of authority. Well, Brian, we're out of time. Um, Good to have you this week, even though it's long distance. (laughs) Yeah, it's great to see you on the screen. You too, yeah. um, 
we'll be back in the studio next week. Sounds good. Next Tuesday. All right. God bless you and have some coffee. <laughs> all right. I'm going to have some. Good stuff there. All right. We're out of time here again. Thank you all for participating. Those that didn't get through, please call again uh, uh, next time. And um, praise the Lord for the calls of ones that did. Remember to pray for the people that had these issues there. We can pray and God would be honoring them and answering their prayers. Okay. For Pastor Brian, I'm Don Stewart saying goodbye and may the Lord.